Okay, really good to see everybody. Well, welcome to our second webinar. This one is on an introduction to the ProAlis survey methodology. And um, we have with us today, we've got our president of Birds Caribbean, Adrian Tassis, and she's gonna be doing closed caption translation. So if you need translation help, um, keep an eye on that. And we have with us Maya Wilson. She's the Landbird Monitoring Program Manager. You've seen a lot of emails coming from her about our new Landbird Monitoring Program. We've got lots of exciting things going on. The um, monitoring workshop in the DR next week, and then a bird banding workshop in um, the Bahamas in March. A few of you might be signed up for that. We'll be doing more bird banding, another bird banding workshop next year. We'll also be doing a one-day training uh, the day after the conference this summer, our conference with the American Ornithological Society. We're having a joint conference. We hope that all of you will register and come to that conference. It's gonna be amazing. Together, we'll um, put that on in San Juan, Puerto Rico. There's gonna be a um, fantastic symposia and workshops, roundtable discussions, field trips. Um, it's gonna be really, really great. So be sure to keep an eye on our website and and registration is gonna go open up in the next couple of weeks. I hope you've seen notices about that. Right now, uh, the committee is accepting abstracts for uh, to give a talk and the deadline for that is um, March 1st. So I hope you'll think about giving a talk at the conference and submitting an abstract as well. So we're delighted to have with us as our trainer for this evening, uh, Jeff Gerbracht. Many of you know Jeff, he's been a longtime member of Birds Caribbean. He's also our eBird Caribbean guru. He's been a training facilitator on many, many of our workshops, um, all around awesome guy. So um, he's gonna lead the webinar tonight and um, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff. Uh, Jeff, you can say a little bit more about yourself if you want. Let me just get started sharing my screen. And sure. <clears throat> some Jeff Kerbrock. Yeah, and, and then uh, also just ahead. some quick, quick um, housekeeping. Sorry. Um, <laughs> if you have any questions or comments, feel free to use the chat. So um, Jeff might throw out a few questions to you. We want to keep you awake and on your toes. So do answer um, any of the little questions that Jeff is going to throw at you. Um, if you have questions for us, put them in the chat. We will try to answer them during the webinar, and if not, for sure, at the end of the webinar. So don't hesitate to um, let us know if you want a question answered before Jeff moves on. All right, so let me share my screen and turn it over to you, Jeff. Great. Okay, so are you seeing the presenter view or are you seeing the, um, the pre pre presenter and oh. you're halfway through the presentation? Oh, shoot. Sorry. Let me, let me try again. Uh, play from the start. And you're still seeing the presenter view, so I need to swap screens. Nope. Now I'm seeing just the slide. Okay, excellent. All cool. right. Great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, as as uh, Lisa mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about the introduction to Perales. Um, I hope uh, most everybody was on the the webinar last week. Um, I'm going to go over a few things that were covered there as well, just basics of monitoring and why we're monitoring, and then dive deeper into the Perales protocol. <clears throat> um, go ahead, Lisa. So first off, since it's a bird talk, we have to show a picture of a bird, right? So um, I'm curious, do people know what this is? Have you ever seen one? Is it your all time favorite bird? Which it's pretty darn cool. Um, and feel free to, to put stuff in the chat. Um, one of the things, and while you're doing that, one of the things that we try to do with bird monitoring is figure out or understand what's happening with these birds. Is the population stable? Um, there's quite a number of them. I don't think they're in um, endangered in any way, shape or form, but we don't know whether the population's stable, declining, increasing. And that's really what bird monitoring is all about, is, is giving us a window into um, the populations of, of these birds throughout the 
throughout the Caribbean is what we're most interested in here. So how are people doing? Did everybody know what it was? Okay, I'm not able to see the chat. So Maya or Adrian, can you monitor and see are people guessing what bird that was? No, no one knows already. Maybe some sort of flycatcher, never seen one, never seen it in Cayman Islands. Yeah, it's not super common all throughout the nope. West Indies, right? So a lot of you may not know this bird. Yep. Which is pretty cool. So it's a rufous-throated solitaire, so Just forest birds. We just had that guess at the last minute. Yes, yes. Uh. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> they range throughout uh, a good portion of the, of the West Indies, but they're a forest bird. They're not often seen, but they are uh, a beautiful little bird. So, yep. So when we think about bird monitoring, and again, uh, uh, we'll rehash a little bit of what we cover or what uh, Holly covered last week. It's really I, starts off with identifying and counting birds on a regular basis in a certain defined area using a defined protocol. And regular can be, you know, monthly, seasonal, daily, you know, whatever time period helps us answer the questions that we're most interested in. Um, certain de defined area, again, may be defined by what we're trying to figure out. Is it a type of habitat, a certain region, um, that sort of thing. And then by defined protocol, I mean, it's the specifics of, of how somebody goes out and counts and records the bird observations. And those data gathered by those, those counts using that protocol can be used to figure out uh, bird abundance or distribution or bird biodiversity. We begin to answer the question of whether this rufous-throated solitaire is doing well um, or is it slowly declining? And this is something we need to be concerned about. So we're going to talk briefly about some of the general considerations in designing a monitoring program. And to me, one of the biggest things is what question are we trying to answer or what questions, because it doesn't have to be a single question. And some of those may be, when is the breeding season for a, for a species? When, when do these solitaires breed? Um, what's maybe their annual survivorship? in different habitats? You know, are they more likely to survive from year to year in one habitat versus another? Uh, is the, again, is the population stable? Is it increasing, decreasing? How are these birds doing? Um, occupancy rates in various habitats throughout the year. Are, are the birds actually moving around and changing um, where they spend their time uh, during their life cycle? Uh, could be broader, could be way beyond just the solitaire, but we're starting to look at full species diversity and maybe disturbed or undisturbed habitat. Um, impacts of, of agroforestry, um, shade versus open coffee, and what impacts might those have on, let's say, neotropical warblers? Um, territory size. And how does that change between breeding and non-breeding season? <clears throat> and then, you know, one of the things that we often don't know as, as well as we'd like is what's the true distribution of a species, especially across areas that are just inaccessible. So some of these questions can be answered by bird count protocols like Perales, others can't. Um, most of the ones that we ran through could be answered some of them like survivorship or territory size would require much more um, in-depth studies, maybe mark recaptures or banding studies. But most of these questions can be answered simply by doing um, a series of point counts using a protocol like the Perales protocol. So I'm gonna get a little bit into um, maybe censusing and sampling and what we mean by that. So here we have a jar of jelly beans. Um, and if you want to take a guess, go for it. I have no idea how many jelly beans are in there, but what, what's, what's the best way to determine 
how can we figure out how many jelly beans are in this jar? Does anybody have a guess, thought? Count every single one. <laughs> That's right. We can dump this jar out and count every single jelly bean, right? And, or we could call Frank Rivera. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, at least you can go ahead and click ahead. Um, but yeah, we can dump this jar out. We can count them. And if we want to know if the population of these jelly beans is declining over time, maybe you've got a kid sneaking in there um, in the afternoon while, while you're uh, taking the dog out for a walk, you can dump it out again a week later and count them again. And you can say, wait, the population of these jelly beans is declining, right? Next. But we can't really do that with birds. It would be great if we could put a jar out in the forest and they'd all fly into that jar and then we could dump them out and count them and then they'd go back off doing what they're doing. But we just can't do that. So what we have to do is we have to sample them. We have to go out and take, take these counts and then extrapolate from those samples to begin to estimate the population and habitat associations and all of the answers to those questions that we have. Oh, does anybody want to guess what this bird is? Oh, yeah. I'm sure some of you know, a few of you. Yes, Giselle. Rosa, it's on the slide. <laughs> oh, is it on the slide? <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, that. But that's okay. It was still a good question. <laughs> so we can set up these uh, protocols or, or counts and, and one of the things we want to think about when we're setting up these protocols is obviously the question that we're, that we're asking. But there's a number of different protocols out there that have been used through, throughout the number of years, right? To begin to answer some of these questions. And as time goes on, modeling efforts and the statistics that are used have, have improved. And, um, we, we, and that's really often a driver for newer protocols to come on the scene. Um, but they all have these commonalities. They're trying to reduce bias, um, trying to uh, reduce the variation, maybe an observer experience or sites, trying to reduce misidentifications, and always trying to increase detectability and the number of samples. And they're all designed in such a way to gather data that we can use the appropriate um, statistics and again, modeling methods to really answer the questions that we're, we're asking, whether it's habitat relationships or total population size, or just whether population is changing over time. So Perales is a specific set of protocols um, designed by uh, both the Canabio and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, focused really on land bird monitoring in Central America. And one of the, one of the major um, aspects of it is it's really designed to maximize sample size. Um, it's good for high diversity areas, birds with varying density in the, in the forest. Um, it's, it can be utilized in dense forest all the way out to more open savanna-like habitats. It's designed to be pretty easy to use, uh, especially compared to more traditional point counts and distance sampling. Um, one of the original goals of Perales was, and, and it's been very successful in, in Mexico, is utilizing community monitors. So volunteers that may have little, little experience with birds and or bird monitoring, and with uh, minimal training, they can, be, they can go out and start to gather very valuable data that then can be used, um, again, by... Uh, the folks who are doing the analysis of these data with occupancy models or abundance and richness models and really use those data to start answering questions and gathering a lot more data than we could traditionally with just a, a handful of people going out and gathering these data. Um, one of the other focuses was making sure that the data entry was simple 
and it went into a system that had a, a good archival method and a way of sharing those data out to the scientists and re researchers who want to access those data and begin to, to look at the data. And it's already adopted pretty broadly in Latin America, um, all the way from Colombia up to Mexico um, and a number of places in between. So there's a growing community around the support for Paralyse, both from how to set up um, Paralyse monitoring programs all the way through data analysis. So there are some questions that Paralyse is, is, is specifically designed to answer and um, we'll go through a couple of those really quickly. Um, one, determining the distribution of a species. Where does the species live? Um, documenting the relationships between the species and its habitat, especially over time. Uh, kind of the same, same, same line, um, but turn, determining how land birds use different habitats throughout the time of year. Estimating relative abundance and trends, which we've already already talked about a couple of times. And then evaluating the effects of management and conservation measures. Do those things really work? Are we seeing an impact of, of conservation measures in the populations of the birds we're studying? Um, uh, evaluating environmental impacts, estimating ecological integrity. How good is the environment doing? Um, birds are, are that can be that canary in the coal mine. And if we really understand what's happening with birds, especially forest birds that, that really require specific habitats, we can really begin to get a sense of how the whole ecological community is doing. Um, again, I think I talked about this before with, with coffee, but evaluating impacts of management strategies or agroforestry projects um, on the land birds and, and the broader biodiversity. Sustainable agriculture projects compared to non-sustainable, you can really evaluate the differences of, of how those are impacting the environment. Um, certification ecological or environmental certification. We can gather information to help inform the certification process. And this is, I think I've mentioned this before, I'm not sure why it's on here twice, but um, using land birds as in indicators of, of ecosystem health. So diving into Paralyse itself and what the counts are, there's actually three different um, count methodologies that are used in Paralyse. Um, there's a two band point count, a three band point count and transect. And we'll go in depth into those in just a minute. But um, what I wanted to point out here, in addition to the beautiful uh, bird that hopefully um, the attendees will see next week, um, the is, is each one of these is, is really geared towards different habitats or, or kind of different groups of birds. So a two band point count is more for closed or semi-open habitats. Um, it's really good for common or evenly distributed species. Um, the three band point count, because there's a third band there. Um, so it, it's actually a, f a further distance that uh, you're, you're counting birds in is is really good for more open habitats. And then transects, which um, again, we'll get into in just a second, is really good in more closed habitats where visibility is, is um, less. And for thinly distributed species, species that are very patchy in their distribution and for even for mixed flocks. So birds, birds and flocks that are moving around. So a two band point count is literally Kind of what it sounds like. Um, you would stand at a point, count all the birds within 30 meters from that point, and count all the birds outside of 30 meters. And so you might see two uh, narrow billed toadies in and three outside of 30 meters, and we, we, we keep track of whether we see those in or out and how many. And then to help us gather more biodiversity data, there's also a way to record flyovers 
Um, so birds that aren't actually in the count area itself, but happen to fly over like a flock of parakeets or maybe maybe a, a small flock of pigeons are, are really good to, to, to note those, to keep the information, but they, they don't necessarily fall within the point count itself. So a three band point count is very similar. It just adds a second band to that. So in this case, you're counting everything within 30 meters. Uh, again, counting everything between 30 and 100, and then everything outside of 100. And you may remember I mentioned that the three band is, is good for more open areas, and you can see why. Um, because if you can't see well beyond 30 meters, you wouldn't want to use a three band point count because you'll never you know, have birds within the 100 meter, 30 to 100 meter band. So it's really something, it's, it's more of an open habitat uh, protocol, but it's very good. It covers more area, which gives us more, more data um, to better understand bird populations. And then there's the transect. Um, and this is good for more closed habitats. And again, for birds that are uh, have a more patchy distribution. Um, I don't know, a number of you have maybe have done point counts and you do a point count and then you walk a hundred meters, do a second point count and you see this fantastic bird in between the two point counts, but you can't count it because it didn't fall in one of the point counts. And transects um, really start to, to gather better information on those birds that are more patchily distributed. Um, and again, in more closed habitats, because this is now 25 meters instead of the 30 meter that we were seeing in the, in the point count. And the transects are 100 meters long, I think it was. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it covers more area. So again, for those patchily distributed birds, if that's what you're interested in specifically, then the transect is a better, a better protocol to go with. So this is a, an example of, of data from Central America that kind of illustrates that, that same point. Um, to the left, you have the white-bellied wren data, and this is uh, the results from some occupancy models run against Perales data. Um, you can see on the left that um, the error bars are pretty similar between the, the within 30 meters, which is the red, and the outside of 30 meters, which is the blue. Um, and for, for a bird like the wren that's more evenly distributed, that within 30 meters gives us very good data and, and good confidence in our results. But when we look at something like Linnaeta woodpecker, which has a, a more patchy distribution and a bigger territory size, you see the error bars around the within 30 meters. And we don't know any, basically with error bars that size, we can't make any guess as to what truly is going on with the species. Um, but once we begin to include that data of everything outside of 30 meters, all of a sudden you can see um, how significantly the, the error bars shrink. And, and now we're, we're able to, um, using the Perales protocol with these bands, really hone in and get better information about some of these more patchly, excuse me, patchly distributed species like the woodpecker. So some of the basics of the Perales protocol here are um, ideally it's, it's uh, two observers. Uh, it doesn't have to be, it can be, you know, one, it can be four, right? Um, for the analysis techniques that are, that are used uh, mostly with Perales, it's really good to have at least two replicates. Um, four to six are a lot better. And even spreading those out over multiple days is really good. And by replicate, um, what I mean here is how many times a, a single point has a count made at it. So if you go out in the morning um, and do a point count at point one, two, seven, and then you go out a week later and do another count at the same point, then that would be two replicates at that at that point. Um, for some of the questions we want to ask or try to figure out, which is habitat related, um, you know, how is the species doing in this habitat versus that habitat? Um, you, the minimum of 20 count locations or count spots per habitat type 
that's it, really the minimum that we can get good um, statistical analysis against and, and really get good confident um, estimates about occupancy and, and abundance trends. We really need at least 20 counts in that in, per habitat. Um, each count is a minimum of 10 minutes. Um, there's no max, but 15 minutes is probably a, a reasonable goal, even for the transect. Um, you know, it's it's a slow walk on the transect, and for the point counts, it's it's you stay at the at the point unless you need to move to identify. You see a you see a warbler, but you can't tell what it is. You can go figure out what it is, and then go back to the go back to that center point, so you can do the distances. Um, there's a minimum distance of 200 meters between points or points and transects. And that number is really there to, to try to greatly reduce the, the chances of double counting uh, an individual or you know, counting the same bird twice. And then <clears throat> the, uh, the last point is um, when you're doing a count and a, let's say, a narrow-billed toady appears and it's 20 meters away, and then it flies to 40 meters away. You always count that bird in the first band where it was detected. So it would be counted in, the, in that less than 30 band uh, as an example of what that is. So does anybody know what this bird is? And even if you don't know the species, what what kind of what group is it? Be great. Good. Pigeon, bridled quail dove. It's a hard picture because a, a, a key bit of it is in the shade. Yep, quail dove, quail dove. A red-eyed dove. I like that. <laughs> That's a good one, Karen. Um, so this is a, a white-fronted quail dove. It's one of the one of the quail doves in in uh, the Dominican Republic. You can't really see the white patch very well, but uh, on the front of its forehead, but it is there. Um, and I think we're we're hoping to see it or and or hear these uh, when we're doing some practice counts in the in the Dominican Republic. But let's say we want to to really try to understand something about this quail dove. Um, how does disturbance impact its um, occupancy, which, which is basically, uh, does disturbance impact where this bird is? And does it, does it vacate areas with different kinds of disturbance? So I grabbed this, this, um, this satellite image for uh, a place close to where the workshop's gonna be. And I said, if, so if we wanted to think about that question, um, and looking at this satellite image, we have, you know, in the upper right, an area where we have patchy forest clearing. So we have patches of, of clearings and, and patches of forest. In the lower left, we have pretty even coverage, but the forest has been partially cleared. So it's not nearly as dense as, as, the, as the more prime primer or primary growth forest, which is, is more analogous to the, to the circle in the middle. So if we were gonna ask that question, um, I think we would wanna set up, let's say 20 counts, 20 points in each one of these areas and, and do those counts over you know, a matter of uh, a week or two weeks. And then we would have enough data that we could begin to say how, how each one of these different um, um, patchiness of the forest impacts the, the, the uh, white-fronted quail dove. And which ones do they vacate immediately? Which, what, you know, which ones do they, there's some in, there's none in. Um, but that's really, that's really how to think about where we want to group point counts to, to again, answer the, the question that we're trying to dive into. So we want to locate points in each one of those circles, right? So if we want to do 20 points in each one of those, we have to figure out, well, where are we going to put those points? Um, so we want to put them at random, but we also want to, at the same time, think about um, how easy is the access, right? If it takes 
five hours for somebody to hike into an area to a point um, that may not be tenable for the amount of uh, time we have for spending time counting, you know, doing actual point counts. So we have to kind of balance that the randomness with the ease of access. And one of the things that Paralysis is really um, designed for is going along small trails or, or tracks in, in the forest. Um, again, part of that is a random. So you might start uh, along a trail at a random point and then go every 200 meters um, and, and put in a, another point or another transect. One of the things we want to do when we're thinking about this though is we want to maximize detections if we can, both visually and, and orally. So if one of those points happens to fall you know, next to a small forest stream and a waterfall uh, that's rather noisy and you, you can't hear, that's, that's when we want to think about, mm, you know, maybe we'll want to move another 20 meters, right, past our, our random point, and that's okay. Um, what we don't want to do when, when laying out points is if we know where there's a quail dove nest, or we know that we always see quail doves in this, in this little pool of water, right, coming in, then we don't want to go and say, I'm going to put a point there just because... I want to make sure we count quails on that point because that's introducing bias to our data instead of reducing it. So we do want to have that randomness to the points, um, taking into account, again, ease of access and maximizing the detections. And then of course, safety. Safety concerns is, is one, of the, one, of the, one of the keys for any of these counts. We all want to be safe when we're out in the forest. Um, I think I'd mentioned already a minimum distance of 200 meters between the counts and making sure that we have at least 20 points in, in each habitat type. So here's an example of, of how somebody might lay out different points or transects. This is actually along a little trail through the forest. You might do the first point, let's say 25 meters in, and then go 200 meters, and then you go another 200 meters, put a point, well, there's something there that may be obstructed visibility greatly. So you go another 30 meters and, and put that point, right? So we do this, and, and as long as we put in at least 200 meters between the points, and we're not, let's say, you know, picking a point because, oh, we saw a bird, so we wanted to do a point here, right? We, do, we want to avoid that that introduction of bias. But that's kind of how I think about setting up the, uh, the actual points that we're, gonna, that we're gonna make counts on. Um, important thing about each one of those counts is naming them. Um, because there's hopefully going to be a lot of data associated with each one of those points over time. And we wanna make sure that when somebody comes out and does a count at that point, they're counting from the same place again and again. Again, that reduces the, the variability, reduces the potential biases that, that might come in. So you, we want to uniquely name each count location recorded in the field book along with uh, the exact coordinates if we have them. Um, we probably want to number each count. So if you have a series of five counts, you may start the name with maybe the habitat or the, the trail name or something like that. And then one, two, three, four, or five. And it's always a good idea if you have flagging tape or you know a tin can lid or something like that, that you can actually tie to a tree or a shrub that, to mark the specific point. Because the person that comes out and, and places these counts may not be the person that's going out two weeks later to conduct those counts. And they need a way to find all of those, those, those locations. So to make sure that counts are done from the same place again and again. Um, I mentioned earlier that the, the Paralyze Protocol, one of, the, one of the things that it's really uh, good at is maximizing sample size. And what that means is really, um, maximizing the number of counts so that we can in increase the quality of data that we get over time and reduce that error bar 
reduce the variability in the results that 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 we that we have or the the um you know if we're, we're trying to estimate the population you know we we don't want an estimate oh it's between one and two thousand right and the and the more samples we take the better we can hone in on what the true population estimate is one way to do this with Peralis is you can have the same person visit this the same points multiple days um there's some other things that I find really interesting, though, that are that are kind of built into this protocol, and one of those is a round trip. So, a person, if you're going onto those five points along a trail, you can visit each point uh, going out, and then wait for 20 minutes, turn around, and do counts on the way back. Um, and with forest birds, that's um, you know, there's there's often concern about well, count one might impact. When you count at the first point and then you count the same point a half an hour later, you might be worried about uh, introducing bias there. But um, I think what we found is that, that, especially with forest birds, that really doesn't, doesn't happen as much. Water birds are different. Um, there's this one that is, I find really interesting, which is the simultaneous. So if you have two people, um, one person can start at, at, at point one, do their count, go on to the next count. And then 20 minutes later, the, the second person does a count at that first point again, and basically follows along. And so um, you can end up getting a, a large number of replicates with very little effort in a, in a morning. Uh, it's a really interesting way to, to think about maximizing sample size and, and getting these replicates of data. Um, here's just a visualization of, of what I'm talking about there with the replicates. You know, the first person starts at 6 a.m., moves on to the second point, and then the second person starts at point one at 6.20 a.m., and they just go along the trail behind each other. Um, they're not together, so there might be some safety concerns there, but they're also usually no more than 200 meters apart. So... They're getting replicates, getting replicates fast, um, doing these independent counts and, and gathering a lot of great data. And then they get to the end, turn around, come back and, and do the same thing. And in a morning, you can end up with four replicates for each point along this, along this set of, of point counts or transects. So I mentioned earlier that that uh, this is really designed for occupancy uh, modeling, but it's it it gathers data that can be utilized for a number of of different analysis and modeling techniques. Um, that's a talk in and of itself that um, I hope that it that will will uh, move forwards with the workshop at some point in the next year or so with uh, data analysis. Um, but it's way, way too much to begin to talk about in a, in a, especially in an hour talk like this. But know that the, the data gathered in Paralyze can be used in a lot of different ways to answer a lot of different questions. And there's a, a paper here for those who want to, uh, to dive in a little deeper. Um, I think we're sharing the slide deck, so don't worry about writing it down. If you want to go look at it, uh, please do. Yeah, we'll be sharing the uh, the webinar recording and the slides from these trainings, and also we'll have a um, shared folder with other resources like publications mm -hmm. and so forth. Yep. Data sheets, the manual. Um, so another bird picture. So you don't have to listen to me drone on. So this one, what bird is it? And what's the plant that it's sitting in? Double points, if you get them. Double right. points. Triple, we'll go triple. <laughs> Anything coming in the chat? I can't see it. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. Cuckoo and Cecropia. A guayumba tree, a kua in a guayumba tree. Hispaniola and lizard cuckoo. Nice. Yep. It's 
a really long tail, really long, large bill. Uh, kind of narrows it down to the to the lizard cuckoos, which are endemic to the to the West Indies. And since this one's on Hispaniola, and yeah, everybody's getting the Cecropia. Great. Cool shot. Yeah. So I mentioned that that one wow. of the things that um, Perales was uh, really thinking about when, they, or the folks were really thinking about when they were designing this, is how do we store the data? Um, so they decided to use eBird, which is a very simple tool um, to to actually enter the data in the field, which is a great thing. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit. I want to go through it fairly quickly because I want to leave a good time for questions. Um, but the eBird mobile app is, is, um, is a great, great way of actually taking that out in the field if you have a mobile phone and you can enter the data right there at the point count, right? And, and then when you get back to connectivity, you can submit that data and then it's, it's gathered, it's stored, it's archived and starts to, to feed into a number of visualizations. So I'm gonna go pretty quickly through the next set of slides, Lisa, if we can. Um, so first thing I would suggest, if you haven't already, is download the mobile app and create an eBird account. You can create an eBird account both from the mobile app itself or from the website at eBird Caribbean. And then um, most of these are gonna be relevant to the mobile app, again, because it is so useful in the field for, for monitoring, especially the Perales protocols. Um, one of the first things you'll see when you get to the, when you download the app is a way to set up preferences. Here you can decide what common name do you want to see bird, bird names in. Um, do you want to see common name and or scientific name? Do you want to see miles or kilometers for distances? Um, one of the important things is allowing the, the eBird app to have access to the location services on the phone, because then it can actually like uh, act as a GPS and keep track of where you are, where the points are, where the transects are. Uh, really nice piece of uh, functionality. Um, and then one of the important things is you can see down at the bottom here, it's a little, uh, a little text, but you want to select a pack. You want to pick the region pack. And in this case, uh, go ahead and go on to the next. Um, we're going to go ahead and pick the, the Dominican Republic pack and install that. And what that will do is actually download onto your phone um, locations, um, bird lists, uh, filters, so you can see what's rare, what's unusual when you're actually entering data on the phone. And then when you get up, or one of the other pieces that is really key to do before we start um, counts is clicking on those little three dots in the lower right. And that opens a settings screen where you can also get to packs, but in this case, we want to go to the settings and account. And at the bottom of that screen, there's this thing called portal and it defaults to eBird. And we want to change that to uh, eBird Caribbean. because the Perales protocols are not enabled for all of the various eBird portals. Uh, there's only a handful of them that are, and eBird Caribbean is one of those. So it's really important to go through and, and set your phone up to use the eBird Caribbean portal. And then you want to create locations. Um, if you're out in the field and you have your phone and you're setting up the locations, you know, assigning the, where, where the point counts are going to be done, you can actually do a, a mini checklist at each one of those. And that will store the locations on your phone so they're easily accessed, you know, the next time you go out. Um, and you can name them there based on the name, you know, that you write down in the notebook so that those, those points are then recorded and, and you can share those points with, with other people that are gonna do the monitoring.
Um, <clears throat> I don't think I said this. So on the on the you can also do it on the website if you have the lat long. You can go through this lat long option, enter the latitude, longitude, and create points that way as well. Um, but that, that's a way in advance, you can create all of these locations in the system. So once the person goes out to start monitoring, it's very easy for them to just pick the point they're at and start counting birds. Um, so we wanna start your count. And when you start a count with the, the mobile app, um, since we're using Parallel's protocols, it's important to actually set the protocol. And we'll show you why in just a second. But basically, you want to click on those three bars at the bottom. And that will go into checklist settings. You'll go to observation type. And then you'll pick one of the three Perales protocols that you're using, whether it's the two band or the three band or the transect. And then when you close that, it goes back to the species list. Looks like nothing's happened, but it really did. Um, so now you can go to the next and you can start entering data. So in this case, um, I saw six common ground doves. I type in, go to the search bar, which is a really fast way to do, to do the entry of species and just type in six space COG, comes up with common ground dove. I click on that and it, it automatically sets six, six ground doves for me. Um, I can also click on the plus sign next to a species. So I see a white winged dove, I can click on that uh, or tap on the, the plus sign, it'll increment it to one. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Go ahead and I tap on it again, increments it to two. Um, then I go in and I, and I see five uh, toady, but I mistype it. I was like, oh, I typed in 59. So one of the things I can do is I can click on the name of the bird here and it'll open up this screen where it has more details around each individual species. And here I can change the number back to five, but you'll notice a little bit lower, all of a sudden we have these bands. So this is where you can actually enter the data for, for these birds and, and assign them to bands. So in this case, I'm trying to read the screen, I'm sorry, but I think I, I had two, two within 30 or and three between 30 and 100. I may have the swap, hard to see. Um, but that's where we actually enter, enter that Perales data and assign the counts to, to the individual bands. Sorry, Lisa, what? No, I was just saying you read that fine. Oh, good. <laughs> um, and then we had a couple of pigeons fly over. Right, I, I, they were going so fast through the trees, I couldn't tell what they were, but I knew they were pigeons. I put them in. Um, click on the, the, the species name again, which in this case is pigeon dove spa because I couldn't identify them to, to species. And it opens up again, but basically that same screen. And in this case, you know, I want to put them in as, as greater than 100 meters, but I also wanted to set them as a flyover. So I can go down to where it says breeding code. And granted, flyover is a very weird breeding code but it is how it's stored today. Um, and you can pick fly over there. And then we know that those birds, you observed those during the count, but they weren't in the count area itself. So um, this is a, a harder one, especially for the DR folks. Um, anybody have any ideas on what this is? Olive capped warbler, question mark. Adelaide's warbler, very close. That's really close. So this is a Barbuda warbler, um, endemic to the island of Barbuda and Antigua Barbuda. Um, and go on to the next, Lisa. Um, and I, I'm going to illustrate this new eBird feature, which I think is very relevant to the Perales data, especially once we enter it in, in via the mobile app. Um, it's, a, it's a way to, to um, basically consolidate a number of counts in a single visualization 
for a single set of visualizations. You see all of the point counts on the map. You can see what new species we're seeing, the species totals. Um, is an easy way of sharing those checklists if you want to share them with a central um, entity. Um, and it gives you links for being able to share this set of information with funders, decision makers, or your friends on Facebook. Um, so it's very simple to create a trip report. It's name, dates, and, and who you want to be able to see it. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and, and enter some, some data related to the Barbuda Warbler surveys that, that we did back in 2019. So I'm going to name it Barbuda Warbler Frigate Bird Surveys between the 28th March and 2nd of April in 2019. And I want to make this public. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna set it to be public. Gives me a list of my trip reports. I go ahead and click on the, the one I just created. And we can easily see the data around all of the surveys that happened. So you can imagine having this for a, for a set of Parale surveys um, in, in, in the forest the, or on, on your island or wherever, wherever we're doing this. You can see all the points. You can see the total number of species. You can see the all of the species that were recorded. You know the the count of those. How many checklists there were were these species seen on? You can even um, put in a narrative. So um, whatever narrative you may want to share about this this survey effort or this this project, and then you can share this, like I said, with with uh, funders or decision makers, and they can go in and they can see all this data as well, right on right on the website. That is so cool, Jeff. Yeah. It's a great feature. Um, is there any questions at this point? Does anybody yeah. want to ask Jeff questions about the protocol or data entry? Again, I can't see the chat, so you'll have to check. Write your question yeah. in the chat, chat. There might be one in the Q&A also. I can't see that either. So Lisa, why don't you jump ahead like four? Like that? Yeah, keep going. Keep going. So, so yeah, I'm going to skip the Merlin part because I want to make sure that people have time for questions. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. There is almost, almost there. Okay. So again, coming to the workshop or setting up a land bird program, I'd really suggest um, downloading eBird app, setting up a user account, loading the pack for the region. Um, make sure you change the portal to birds Caribbean to eBird Caribbean. And then, start using it, go out and do some counts. Um, Merlin is a nice little tool as well. It's kind of like a modern field guide in your pocket, um, has photos of birds, descriptions of birds. Uh, you can play sounds. It will also do sound identification and photo identification both. Um, it also has a pack. Um, it's, it's pretty big, so you have to make sure you have room on your phone but it is a nice tool to, to have with you when you're in the field doing, doing monitoring. And that's it. Thank you, everybody. And yeah, let's dive into questions if anybody has any. Somebody had raised their hand. If you can check on that, Diego raised his hand with a question. Uh, do you want to unmute and ask the question? Is that all right? Yeah. Diego, you should be able to ask a question now. I think you have to unmute still. So. Uh, I thought I did. I said un allow to talk. Here I can. He might, he might have to do it. Okay. He, yeah. He's muted himself, but I think we have unmuted him. Oh, he said was not raised. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry to put pressure on you. <laughs> okay. Any um, questions in the chat? Scrolling up. They asked if we would be using both apps in the workshop, eBird and Merlin. Um, would definitely be using eBird. Um, Merlin is, a, is a, a, again, a really nice thing to have in the field. Um, you may hear a bird 
and not know for sure what it is, um, you can actually enable sound ID and it will give you its best estimation of what it is. Um, Merlin's not, you know, it's not a bird ID tool. It doesn't ID everything for you, but it gives you guidance in, in those identifications. So Merlin is a, a nice thing to have, but it's certainly optional. Um, but eBird is a really good thing, especially for doing the point counts in the field. I'm guessing a lot of people are already eBird users, which is great. Daniela asks, can we use only one of these sample maximizing tools for the same site or research? So I think you're asking whether like you can do uh, out and back, do double counts or four replicates in a day and, and makes that with say one person going out and absolutely, um, that's fine. You can, you can definitely have one person go out and do five points in one day. And then you might have two people go out and do it out and back and end up doing 20 point counts on, on the same five points um, in another day. And yes, that's, that's, that's fine. If that was, if that was, if that's, wasn't the question you're asking, let me know. <laughs> She said, I meant if we can combine them. Um, does that mean like combining point counts and transects in the same habitat, for example? Or maybe she refers that if we can combine the data from different observers, uh huh. Right. So, so the data analysis and modeling modeling tools um, can certainly treat observer as a covariate in the analysis of the data. So, you know, since data are entered through eBird, you know, we have the observer's information as well as the the um, the counts. So, observer time of day, uh, you know, the date. All of those things are kind of covariates in the analysis and are taken taken into account in the modeling. She, she did clarify, Daniela did clarify the simultaneous or round trips option. Can you combine those, I think? Um, yes. So you can, have, you can have the simultaneous, so you can start with two people, um, you go out, do five or 10 points, and then come back do the five or 10 points again, and you end up getting four counts for each point in, in one, one morning or one go. So that's a good question, um, Giselle. Do um, uh, you really, if um, it's a hard one to answer, it depends uh, if, you're, if you're really focusing in on a habitat you might have be able to do five points in one habitat or three points in, in one area. You might have an area of similar habitat. Um, you know, you can certainly um, combine different areas of habitat. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're trying to answer questions around a certain habitat. So maybe you have 10 patches of forest, but none of them are big enough to do 20 points in, but combined you can do 20 points. That's, that's, that would be the way to go. Um, and, it, and it depends on also on the question that you're really trying to answer too. Um, so we did before it gets too far off the, off the list. Uh, David yeah. asked, uh, when using the replicate approach, is the data averaged? So that's getting more into the data analysis. Side. Right, right. <laughs> I think it depends, it, yeah. Yeah, I think it would depend on the analysis tools that you were using for it and, um, and what question you were trying to answer. Mm -hmm. So. And then Kai asked, do you know of any volunteer programs that can assist with periodic surveys on islands that have limited capacity? <laughs> That's a good question. I'll open that to everybody. <laughs> 
any that's of the panelists or, or any of the attendees have a have an idea on that? Well, that's part of what we're trying to yep. get started here, right? <laughs> yeah. Increase local capacity. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. And there's some nice examples from the Caribbean, you know, where local people have been trained, just regular citizens that don't necessarily have a biology or even birding background. Um, EAG in Antigua and in Barbuda, they, a couple of years ago during the peak of the pandemic in 2020, did a course, a six session virtual course on um, bird ID and how to monitor birds. And they formed a bird club. And now that bird club is going out regularly and doing monitoring all over the island. They're doing Caribbean waterbird census counts, hopefully with this training, which Sean is gonna go to, they'll also add land bird monitoring. And so again, EAG, you know, it's a small NGO, they do amazing stuff, but have limited time and capacity. So mm -hmm. they found a way to get um, citizens involved and make it fun. You know, it's like a, mm -hmm. a fun group, social group. They've got t-shirts and, you know, swag. And so that's, that's one way to go is to, and what we hope to do with this workshop is train you guys as the trainers so that you can get a cadre of people trained on your islands that can help you with the monitoring that you need done. So we'll train you and then you'll go home and train hopefully a group of volunteers that can help out. Um, Karen asks, can you remind me, when do you do the point counts versus transects? I think uh -huh. that's something we're gonna cover a little bit more in depth in the workshop, but I don't know if there, there's a simple answer to that. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it depends on visibility, you know, how thick the habitat is um, in combination with the um, kind of maybe the birds that you're most focused on. Um, if birds are more evenly distributed and you have okay visibility, point counts are usually better. Um, if the vegetation is very thick, um, and 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 you also really want to make sure that you're capturing those those birds that are more widely distributed or patchily distributed. Then transects are better, um, and it's perfectly fine to do both. To to have a you know a series of five or ten counts and do four point counts and six transects. You know, really, really, you can adjust that as you're in the field, and you can see what what the conditions are and what makes sense for each each site. And as you're recording data at each point, it's all birds seen and heard, right? Yes. So you can correctly yep. identify to the best of your ability. Yep. So. Yep. With yep. and again, it, it assigned to the to the appropriate bands. Mm -hmm. So Jeff, when you were showing the data entry, do you have to click on each species every time to put it in or out of the band, or does it automatically go to within the 30 meter band, and then you have to click on it to get the other options? So so it. You have to to explicitly go in and say which band they are. It doesn't default to one or the other. Oh, okay. um, I think I think my view. I know what would happen with me if I did that is I would forget to go in and everything would be in in the 30, 30 meter band. So mm -hmm. I think it's it's actually probably safer um, for data accuracy to to have it explicit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in this case too, I think with two people in the field for safety, um, would you advise one person be doing the count and the other person recording an eBird on the mobile app just to help with data analysis? I think it, I think it depends on experience and, and how, how experience, how diverse the region is. Um, you know, if, if, if you're going to go to a point count and there might be 30 different species and a bunch of birds, then you really need two people, right? Mm -hmm. um, if, if it's much fewer individuals, uh, one person could certainly do it on, on their own mm -hmm. with, uh, with the phone. Um, it's, 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 you know, it depends. <laughs> like, like most of these things, right? Um, there's subtleties to it and and um, just kind of have to look at the situation and see what makes the most sense. Right. So it probably pays to do some pilot surveys to figure yeah. out your methodology and know, get to know the site. And... Right. And when you're going out to, to assign points, that's certainly one of, the, one of the times to do that. Right. So this is something that you guys will be practicing in the field, I'm guessing, is 
going out and doing some counts, assessing a site, and then discussing like, what would you do here? Would you do a yep. trans? Would you do thirty two band, three band? You know, try some different habitats and, and yep. practice all these methods and yep, exactly. Discuss, discuss the best methodology and also discuss your questions. What would you? What kind of questions would you be answering? And what would be the best way to do that? Looks like questions have slowed down. <laughs> I have one, don't be shy. All right, did we answer all the questions in the chat? And a so. reminder, yeah, we'll try to get this up on YouTube as soon as possibly on our YouTube channel, the recording, and also share a link with you to the PowerPoints. Yes and the recordings and a few of you will be seeing in the DR next week. Oh, and Adrian had a good question. Uh, sorry, what if we don't have cell phone signal in the areas where we're doing the counts? Um, so one of, the, one of the really good things that, I, um, that you will wanna do is download those packs in advance because that, that, that restricts the bird list down. Um, and if you do the points, if you create the points in advance, um, then when you're in signal, you can actually get all those points on your phone. So that then when you go out into the field, even though you don't have signal, the GPS of the phone may still be working and you still have a good species list and, 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 and filter. So you can still do that count and then enter the data, actually submit the data once you get back in the, in the signal range. So that's one of the good reasons to, to try to get the pack downloaded onto the phone because it, it enables you to do that remote that remote work. Good, thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining. It was so great to have you. And again, look for an email for us with um, the recordings and links. Uh, oh, Kai had a comment. Sometimes mm -hmm. islands are that small that it is very hard to find dedicated volunteers, true. And so what about creating a SWAT special wildlife assessment team that will visit the islands at predetermined times at the cost of the management agency? Sure, sign me up. <laughs> I'll be on that team. No, that's it's, a great idea, Kai. Yeah, it is. You know, and it could work really well. I agree with you. Um, you know, some roving, uh, monitors that could come help out. And we have done that kind of informally when we have done some of our surveys, especially post-hurricane surveys. Um, we've utilized local help, but then if there wasn't enough, we brought in people from other islands to help out. And so um, that can certainly work as well. Yeah. Yeah, lots of people um, would be happy to volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks again, everybody for joining. Um, Keep your questions coming. We can continue discussing over email and um, in person next week at the workshop and we'll keep everybody informed and share materials. Um, and don't forget, we'll also be doing a one day training on ProAlis uh, the day after the AOS BC conference in Puerto Rico this summer. So you should definitely come to that. You can sign up, register to come to that one day training. We'll, we'll also be practicing these techniques in the field. And yes, we'll try to do more workshops online. I know they have their advantages because um, you can reach more people, you don't have to travel. But yeah, practice in the field and being in person sometimes is important too, but we will, um, we will do as much as we can online and share everything with you as much as possible too. And yeah, and keep an eye on our social media next week because we will maybe share some, some things from the field, um, you know, do some live demonstrations of counts and so forth. So do keep an eye on our Instagram and Facebook um, and we'll try to give you a heads up if we're gonna do some things live. And yes, definitely join our website. Uh, make sure you're signed up to our list, listserv um, and, and getting our newsletter. If you're not, um, send me a message at, I'll give you my email. You should definitely be getting our, um, our newsletter and be signed up to our listserv because we discuss and share information on um, bird monitoring, research, conservation, all that. So lisa.sorensen at birdscribbing.org. If you're not receiving our monthly newsletter, or if you're not yet on our Birds Caribbean listserv on groups.io, let us know and we'll get you signed up. 
that's how we're, okay. we're definitely going to share other training opportunities too. So yes, absolutely. Yeah. More training opportunities will be coming up. Okay. Thanks everybody again for joining. Go grab some dinner and have a good night and we'll be in touch. Take care.